Hey, Professor Davis here. We are going to be looking at the urinary system and the diseases and disorders. So before we get started, let's just do a brief overview of the anatomy and physiology. Remember that with the urinary system, we do have the two kidneys and the kidneys are the functional organ of this system, meaning they're the one that actually does the job of creating the urine and filtering the blood for the waste that's present. And when we talk about waste here, it's the liquid waste that is produced by your cells. So we look at removing the waste products from the bloodstream. This is done at the kidneys. It has a special structure in the kidneys called the nephron that actually does the filtering. In that process, there's a lot of back and forth that happens, cleaning the blood, preparing the urea that eventually becomes urine to leave. Once the urine is created, it leaves the kidney through the ureters. The ureters are the tubes that run from the kidney to the bladder. So they're just there to transport the urine. The bladder is going to store the urine for a period of time. It is a muscular organ. This is so that the muscles can help you empty the bladder. Um, and then the urethra is the tube that goes from the bladder to the outside world that the urine then takes that pathway. Now, the process of actually urination is called microtrition, and this is a reflex. It's not something you have to really control. You do have a sphincter that you can hold. That's why we have to call it potty training because we have to learn how to close that sphincter and prevent this reflex from taking over. Um, but once you open that external sphincter, uh, urination is just going to happen because it is a reflex that's taking place using the muscles of the bladder in order to release the urine out through the urethra. Now there is some differences when we look at the, the urinary system for males versus females, but the main, the main difference is just with the urethra. In females, that urethra is only about an inch and a half long, so it's not a very long tube from the bladder to the outside world. Um, this You're going to see that this actually causes some issues issues when we look at some of these urinary um, disorders and diseases because it's such a short diff a distance from the outside world to the bladder the female is prone to some things more than males in males the urethra is about six to eight inches long it does travel from the bladder out through the penis now one thing with this too is that there is a connection there with the urethra with the reproductive system in males. In females, the reproductive system and the urinary system are completely separated, but in males, there is this connection here. All right, so let's talk real quick about urine. Um, when we're looking at urine, normally it's going to be clear, maybe with a slight yellow kind of gold color to it. And so it does have a coloration, but it's clear in the sense that you can see through it, All right? There's not a lot of stuff clouding up the urine. It's free from sediments, meaning it does not have anything clouding it. It has a distinct odor, but it's not, it shouldn't be a foul smelling odor. It will have a distinct odor, but not smell really bad. Specific gravity, this is what stuff is dissolved in the urine. Should it be anywhere between 1.005 to 1.03? Anything more than that, there could be problems, okay? We see that urine normally has a pH of about 6, but it could be a little more acidic, down to 4, and it could also be basic up to 8, depending on the, what the kidneys are needing to remove waste-wise from your blood. But on average, it's normally a pH of 6, now, looking at the urine is called urine analysis, and it is actually a really good diagnostic tool because if there's any changes to these like normal conditions of the urine, there's a good chance that something's going on. It can lead us into that direction of further tests. Over here in this picture, it also shows you how the urine color can change. Um, it does a lot of times give you indications of if you're hydrated enough. If you've got enough water in your system, your urine will be more diluted. However, if you do not have enough water, and you're dehydrated, your urine will be more concentrated. Normally, your first void or urination of the day is the darkest color because you haven't drank anything through the night while you were sleeping. Now, because of that, it will normally be the darker color. Now, there are some common signs and symptoms that we do see with 
diseases of the urinary system. And so let's go through some of these. We have first hematorrhea. Hematorrhea is blood in the urine. And this could be very small amounts. It could be large amounts. Um, sometimes it's even trace where you can't even see it. But when we would do the test with the urine analysis, we may be able to detect that blood is in the urine. Um, we also have pyuria. This is going to be pus in the urine. This would tell us that the immune system is fighting something and there are there's white blood cell and foreign invader debris that's part of that that creates that pus. We could also have pro proteinuria. This means that there's protein in the urine and the main one that they detect a lot of times is albumin. We could have dysuria. Dysuria is difficulty or pain with urination. Nocturia means that you um, have issues where you have increased voiding or urination at night. So this is where you can't hold it through the night. You have to get up several times to go to the bathroom. Oguria, when we look at oguria is decreased urine output. You're not producing very much urine. You're still producing some, but it's very low amounts. Whereas anuria means that you're not producing any. Okay, no urine is being produced. Also, we can see that some of the common signs and symptoms deal with the frequency, like how often you're going to the bathroom, where you may be going more frequently or not as much. And then also the urgency, how quickly do you need to get to the bathroom once you know you need to go? Okay, sometimes we have the ability to hold it for a while, but other times you don't. And that's that urgency being, being where you have to go right, right away. Now, we do see a lot of times that there could be pain that comes along with some of these diseases and disorders. A lot of times it's in the low back and down the flank region. We can see nausea, vomiting, a malaise, and fatigue with some of these, especially when we look at certain infections of the urinary system. And we do see that the kidneys having issues, the urinary system having problems could actually be an indication that other body systems are having difficulty, meaning that the kidneys are trying to compensate and help out those other systems. And these include the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system. Specifically, if the patient has like hypertension, high blood pressure, if they have edema and swelling that's present, and even shortness of breath, the urinary system may try to help compensate and uh, make adjustments for issues in those areas. All right, so now let's take a little bit closer look at some of the diagnostic tests that we use for the urinary system. The first and foremost is the urine analysis. We take a sample of the urine, we look at it, we evaluate it, we may even use some tests to look for things like glucose and protein, blood, um, white blood cells, pus, and things like that in the blood or in the urine itself. And so urine analysis is a really good non-invasive type of diagnostic test. We can also do urine cultures and sensitivity testing where we take some of that urine, we place it on a growth plate, we then let it grow to see what bacteria are present. And guys, there should be some bacteria present because you do have good bacteria that is there to help protect you. However, we don't want to see too much. And if we do see a large amount of bacteria, we can also do a sensitivity test to see what antibiotics work best against that bacteria. Blood tests can also be done to look at the urinary system. This includes looking at the blood urea nitrogen level, or what they call it the BUN test, as well as the creatine clearance. Those things are things that we would look at with the blood because those things should be filtering out through the kidneys and those levels could fluctuate if the kidneys are having difficulty. We also see that we could do a kidney, ureter, and bladder test. This is a KUB. This is a type of x-ray. So we would do an x-ray where we're looking at the kidneys, the ureters, down into the bladder. We can also do what we call an intravenous pilogram or IVP. This is going to be where it's an x-ray with dye that's been added into the bloodstream. And as the kidneys go through the process of filtering out the kidneys, that dye would give you a type of picture through the x-ray. We also see that you could do a cystogram. A cystogram is an x-ray of the bladder after dye has actually been installed through a catheter. So they'll take a catheter and they'll insert the dye into the bladder to where it coats the bladder and then they would take an x-ray to take a look at it. We could also do a cystoscopy. This is going to be where they take that little lighted camera to go inside into the bladder and take a closer look. Most of the time they're going to use this for the urethra and the bladder itself. They don't normally go higher into the ureters or kidney with this. 
We also see that a bladder and kidney biopsy may need to be done with certain types of diseases or disorders. That way we can get an indication of what those cells are doing and if there is cancer cells present. And then also we have may have to do catheterization. This is where they put the catheter in so that they can gain access to the urine. This might be to help relieve the urine if they have difficulty trying to go. It could also be that we want to get a sterile sample of the urine. So we would do that through putting in the catheter. Now, when we look at this catheterization, there are different types, okay? And you can see them here. So we're gonna talk about that bigger picture in a minute, but let's look at the three with the catheters. We could do an in and out catheter that you can see here. The in and out catheters where we're gonna insert the catheter, take out some of the urine, and then pull it right back out. It's very temporary in its placement. On the other hand, we, or it could also be an in and out when we're looking at sometimes a surgery where we just need to put the catheter in until after the surgery is over. You're not doing a lot of movement, so it's not going to end up pulling. On the other hand, we may have to do one that's an indwelling catheter. It may have to stay for a while. Sometimes for some patients, it stays constantly and it just gets changed out periodically. This one is going to be where the catheter is inserted and a little balloon is inflated. That balloon helps make sure we can't just pull the catheter out very easily. It helps hold it in place. The last one down here, is the suprapubic catheter. This one is gonna be surgically inserted above the pubic symphysis into the body to where it's not using the actual urethra to gain access to the bladder. Okay, so these are the three different types of catheters that could be used. In this other picture over here, you can see what they would use with the cystoscopy where they're gonna take the small little camera and go in through the urethra into the bladder to take a closer look. All right, so now let's jump into these different types of diseases and disorders. And the first one we wanna look at are called urinary tract infections or UTIs. So this is a very common type of infection. It's a broad diagnosis though. You might get the diagnosis of a UTI, but there's a lot of different areas that could be affected with a UTI. This could be where there's an infection in the urinary tract from the urethra, the bladder, all the way up to the kidneys. Now, when we look, there are different types. They can get more specific names based on their location. And so if it's the entire urinary tract infection, you can see in the first picture, this goes from the bottom all the way to the kidneys. You could also have urethritis where the urethra is the only issue, cystitis where it's the bladder, pyelitis where we're looking just more at the pelvic area of the kidney and then we also could have pyelonephritis where it's the kidney as a whole going from that um, area that is the pelvic area of the which extends extends all the way into those nephrons. Now the most common cause of UTIs are bacteria. However, they can also be caused by viruses or fungus as well. E. coli is the main culprit. E. coli is a bacteria that is found in your large intestines and it's fine as long as it stays there. However, if it gets anywhere else in your body, it can cause major issues, infections. And so this is one of them. And this is because the urethra is relatively close to the anus where the E. coli would come out with the feces. This is going to be in a minute, we'll see, is why it's more of an issue with females because those tubes are all closer together and wiping is such a big deal. Using the proper hygiene in order to clean yourself up after going to the bathroom could help prevent E. coli from gaining access as it's the most common. So when we look at UTIs, UTIs are a lot more common in females than males. And there's a number of reasons why. For one, the female urethra is a lot shorter and the opening is a lot closer to the rectum. And so because of that, it puts them at a higher risk. Some females have improper toilet habits, okay? And with this, this is why when you wipe, you should wipe from front to back. If you wipe from back to front, you're pulling that E. coli and those other things from the rectum towards the urethra, which puts you again at that higher risk. Okay. We also see vaginal secretions may harbor bacteria. Okay. Also, while male prosthetic secretions have antibacterial effects, so they actually have a built-in area where the prostate will release certain um, substances and they do have antibacterial components. Whereas females do not, the vagina actually has its own set of bacteria present 
Sexual intercourse may cause trauma to the urethra and bladder leading to inflammation and infection in females. So that's more common because again, due to the close proximity and internally, they're also very close together. Pregnant females are also more susceptible due to the presence of the uterus on the urinary tract. The uterus sits right there on top of the bladder, which causes the woman to already have issues with uh, frequency and urgency. And so also it could potentially cause some other issues with UTIs. Now, diagnosis is going to be done by doing a urine analysis. Um, and a lot of times they'll take a culture of this because they want to see what bacteria is growing. Depending on what the bacteria is, we'll determine what kind of antibiotic we want to prescribe. Some antibiotics are better against certain bacteria than others. And so if we can be more specific, the better it will be. Okay. And so antibiotics. Now, one thing too is guys with antibiotics, it's super important that you take them as prescribed. Even when you're feeling better, you need to go ahead and finish them off. Even though sometimes they can cause adverse effects with what we call antibiotic diarrhea and things like that, you need to finish off the antibiotic because then this gives you the biggest chance of preventing reinfection or creating almost like a super tight of bacteria later on. All right, so let's look at the different types of UTIs. So we have uh, urethritis. This is going to be inflammation of the urethra itself. This one is actually a little more common in males than it is females, and this is because of the length. In females, it's such a short distance, we actually see that the UTIs travel into the bladder a whole lot faster, but in males, it's in the urethra. One of the big issues with this too is this is actually a common symptom with gonorrhea infections. Females can also increase their risk for this by wearing tight clothing, having application of certain kinds of soaps and powders down there, as well as sexual intercourse increases a female's chance of developing this. Now, it commonly occurs with cystitis, which is inflammation of the bladder, again, especially in females, and symptoms include swelling of the urethra, dysuria, where they have pain or burning as they urinate, and urethral discharge, that is present. Some other sexually transmitted diseases that also can cause symptoms with um, urethritis is chl are chlamydia and genital herpes. Now for cystitis, we see that this is an inflammation of the bladder. It's also known as a bladder infection. Um, there are several types, but one that actually gets a specific name is known as honeymoon cystitis. And this occurs in females as they become sexually active. When they first become sexually active, we do see that there is this higher chance of them developing cystitis. Treatment is usually antibiotics because it is normally a bacterial infection. We may also see antispastic medications can help decrease the bladder spasms that happen with cystitis. It's one of the actual symptoms that we see that they have these spasms of the bladder that takes place. Peridotum is the main medication that we would use for this, and it may cause the urine to turn kind of a reddish orange color, and it can stain the clothing if it gets on the clothes. After treatment, we do want to see that the urine... Um, after treatment's been done, we do want to take a urine sample and do the culture and sensitivity test. So the C and S is the culture and sensitivity test to determine if the bacteria has been eliminated due to the treatment. So pyelitis is the next one. This is inflammation of the kidney pelvis. So that area where the ureter comes in to the kidney, where that connection takes place. This results from an ascending infection normally from the bladder. So the, the infection is in the bladder. It goes and travels up the ureters to the kidney itself. This is the type of UTI that is very common in young female children. And part of this has to do is they're learning the habits of taking care of the wiping and things like that, as well is the fact that they may hold their urine for too long, especially while they're in school. It's really important that those kids, if they really need to go to the bathroom, that they go and relieve themselves because holding the black, holding the urine in there too long, especially if they've already got a UTI forming, could cause it to start to travel up to the kidneys. Rapid diagnostic Rapid diagnosis and treatment is imperative to prevent the spread of the infection up into the entire kidney as well as into potentially the bloodstream. We do not want it to get into the bloodstream and cause the patient to start to become septic. 
We also have pyelonephritis. This is going to be due to ascending again infection that could take place if we do not catch it early enough. However, this type of UTI could also be caused by a hematogenous infection, meaning that there was an infection in the blood that then transferred to the kidney. So this is the opposite direction. This came from inside the body and it's now moving down. And so this comes from the blood. This may affect one or both kidneys and symptoms are things like sudden onset of fever and chills because we're already deeper in into the urinary system. They may also have flank pain and hematorrhea where there is some blood in the urine. Now, a lot of times this is treated effectively with antibiotics, but again, we may need to do a type of culture and sensitivity test to figure out what antibiotic would work best. All right, so now let's move on to diseases of the kidneys. When we look at disease of the kidney, we have the glomular nephritis. There is acute glomular nephritis and chronic. When we're looking at acute glomular nephritis, there's inflammation in the glomerulus, and this is the area that's going to be what filters the blood. So the nephron has an area of blood vessels that comes in, and then there is this little kind of glomular cap that's here. The blood is going to get pushed out and this is going to be filtering it and sending it into the nephron tubes. So we see that this filtering unit of the kidney is being affected. This is the most common kidney disease that starts to occur one to four weeks after a strep throat infection. Um, one thing with this is strep, if it stays in your throat is one thing, but if it gets dislodged while your body is trying to fight it and it finds its way to different organs in your body, it can cause some major issues. It causes problems on the heart. It can also cause problems in the kidneys. What happens here is the strep gets placed on the kidney and your immune system fights it. And that's fine, except for your immune system does a cross reaction with the tissues in the kidney. And it also starts to fight some of those causing damage to occur. That damage is going to be what causes this type of kidney disease, this glomular nephritis. So when we look at this, we're saying that it's not actually due to the infection that's causing the issue. It's the inflammation that's resulting due to the tissue destruction from your immune system. So this is an antigen antibody reaction that's taking place in your tissues. So when we look at glomular nephritis, the acute version, we do see that there are quite a few symptoms. So this can be flank pain. So you'll have pain in those areas, fever, loss of appetite, the patient will also have malaise where they just don't feel good, edema of their eyes and their ankles. And this is due to the swelling where, because the kidneys are not filtering like they should. We also may see oleria where it's very low amounts of urine being produced and hematorrhea where there is blood in the urine. Treatment. We may want to use antipyretics for the fever to br help bring the fever down. Diuretics might be used to help get rid of the edema and also cause the kidneys to hopefully filter out that fluid. Salt restriction may need to happen because when you eat a lot of salt, you retain more fluid. And if we're already having swelling, we want to prevent that. Protein restriction and fluid restriction as well. Again, trying to make sure that we're restricting the things that could cause you to hold on to excessive amounts of fluid when we want to try to get that fluid actually off. Prevention, prompt and proper antibiotic treatment for streptococcal infections are super important. If you do have strep throat, getting the proper antibiotics and taking them like you're supposed to would help prevent the complication that can happen with that strep throat infection. Okay, so it can help prevent acute glomeronephritis. If we're looking at chronic glomular nephritis, this is going to be where you have repeated bouts of acute glomular nephritis. This leads to then a chronic condition. So you have a bout, you have, you know, a bout with it, and then you have another one and another one, and it starts to build up and cause problems. These are going to be, when we look at the symptoms, they're going to include all the ones we saw in the acute glomular nephritis. But another thing we're going to start to see though, is that the patient's going to develop hypertension because it's more chronic. We see that the kidneys are supposed to help filter out and get rid of that excess excess fluid to help you control your uh, blood pressure, they're not going to be able to do that here. Uremia may occur during the late stages. Okay. And so we do see that there could be 
Uremia may occur during the late stages, and this is where we see the urea levels in the blood being really high because the kidneys are not removing them. The kidneys are starting to kind of shut down in a sense. We see treatment is to control the hypertension. This will help the kidneys be able to rest a little bit in between. Dietary restrictions may need to be done like we saw before, and the end stage may require what we would call hemodialysis, so going through the blood, doing dialysis to clean it out, and a kidney transplant may need to be performed. The next one is hydronephrosis. Hydronephrosis is going to be where urine starts to collect in the renal pelvis. Again, where the ureter comes into that pelvic area of the kidney, we see there could be an obstruction that's taking place. This could lead to dilation and distension of the kidney pelvis because the urine starts to fill up the place and it starts to push and open that up. The diagnosis is going to be through that, through the pileogram. So we're going to end up using the dye with the picture with the x-rays to take a better look at this. Um, we do see that the kidney starts to become super enlarged and it can cause anorrhea where anorrhea and anorrhea where we do not produce urine because it's being blocked here. All right, this then could turn into uremia where the urine or urea content in the blood is super high. So what's the treatment here? Treatment would be draining of the kidney pelvis by doing surgery to drain it. And then we need to actually find out where the obstruction is and relieve it. We need to fix that. And so that way the urine can go through its normal pathway from the kidneys pelvic area to the ureters into the bladder. The next kidney disease that we see is renal colliculi. Renal colliculi is also known as kidney stones. Kidney stones are a pretty painful thing. My husband has had several of them. I have also had a kidney stone. They tend to form in the kidney pelvis, but they could form up in the nephron areas as well. Some of the main symptoms that we see are going to be hematorrhea, where we do see that there is some blood in the urine. We see that there's renal or what we call urinary colic, where there's an extreme spastic flank pain. So as the urine pushes this stone forward, it actually causes extreme pain in the back area and the low back and and coming down to the flank and into the leg and even into the groin area at times. One thing with this too is that these stones guys are not like real smooth stones like you see like in a riverbed. They look like stickers and if you're from where we are down here in New Mexico it's like those goat heads those really bad stickers and as they move through these tissues they tear them. This is where a lot of that blood comes from. We also see that a lot of people will talk about it's the worst pain in their life and it was not a fun experience to go through. I have a friend who's a nurse who's had two kidney stones and two kids and she would say that she'd want those uh, kids over those kidney stones any day. The pain with the kids was nothing compared to the stones. Um, I didn't have normal childbirth so I can't have a comparison but that, that kidney stone was very painful. We see that when we look at this too, to increase your risk of developing kidney stones would be if you're very dehydrated and you remain dehydrated for long periods of time. That doesn't help flush out the components that help make kidney stones. Also, if you have chronic UTIs, you have a higher risk. And if you are immobile, not moving about, you are bedridden, it can increase your chances. Some other things that increase your chances, if you're male, especially if you're male middle-aged, your diet could also play a role. And it's based on how your body is going to process certain kinds of minerals, things like, so like calcium, carbonation, and even caffeine. When we look as well, diagnosis a lot of times of a kidney stone is going to be by using an x-ray. So the IVP with the dye might be used, the KUB where they just do the x-ray of the kidney, ureters, and bladder because that's where it's going to take the pathway for the kidney stone to leave. And we may even do a renal ultrasound as well. Treatment a lot of times is pain medication. The medications to help you deal with the pain as the stone is trying to pass. You would increase your fluid intake to help again flush the stone out. Um, some things that you may also do is if you were to drink things that are a little more acidic, the acid might help dissolve parts of that stone. Things like um, they'll talk about cranberry juice or even pineapple juice might be helpful.
Um, they may even strain your urine in order to collect the stone, especially if you make stones on a regular basis, they may want to determine what the stone is made out of, and that can help you make dietary changes, um, to help prevent maybe further stones from forming. They may even do what we call the lipsotripsy procedure. This is going to be where they're going to break the stone into smaller parts in order for you to pass it easier, but then you have to pass each part. And um, there's two different ways they do this. The main way they do it is using sound waves where they shoot sound waves at the kidney to break up the stone. My husband calls that the mortal combat method. Um, they could also go in with a little laser and break the stone into um, smaller pieces. And he calls that the Star Wars method. Um, but they also may need to do surgery. And when we do surgery, they go in and they're going to help remove some of those stones. They may even put a stent in to try to help open it up so that they can pass through a little easier. The problem with surgery though, guys, is the more you go into the kidney, the kidney can't repair itself in when scar tissue starts to fill in the areas of the nephron and the kidney, the kidney function starts to decrease. So if we can get rid of the stone without having to actually surgically go into the kidney, that's what they would prefer to do if possible. So with polycystic disease, this is an inherited disease that causes enlargement of your kidneys. And it's due to these formations of these grape-like cysts that start to develop in the kidneys and on the kidneys. Now, the problem with this is these cysts are fluid filled. And they, when we say that they or cause enlargement of the kidneys, they actually will cause the kidneys to start to weigh 20 to 30 pounds more than they should. So this is a big issue when we talk about uh, polycystic disease. This is a slow progressive disease that takes place. A lot of times it starts to create these cysts when they are teenagers and young adults, but because they continue and it's slow and progressive, we don't necessarily notice that there's a big issue until a little later. And this could potentially cause the patient to go into kidney failure in their 30s and 40s. Symptoms include lumbar pain, hematuria, and they may have recurrent UTIs. The main treatment is management of hypertension. So we want to keep their blood pressure under control as well as trying to make sure that they don't get too many UTIs. So making sure they don't get too aggressive with those. Dialysis and kidney transplant may also need to occur with individuals who have polycystic disease. But guys, this right here, when we talk about dialysis and, in, and kidney transplant, those are the end stage treatments where the kidney failure is already occurring. And so a lot of times, guys, people, even though we know the kidneys will continue to decrease, they don't even get put on the kidney transplant list until the kidneys are functioning only at about 35%. And so this means the patients has to go in for dialysis in order to get help to clean that blood. Once they can get a kidney, though, then they could come off a of dialysis if their body does not reject that new kidney. All right, this leads us to actual renal failure. Um, when we look at renal failure, this is failure of the kidneys to cleanse the blood of waste products. And we do see that some of the stuff we saw before could lead to this. It could have started as polycystic disease, but now it's actually in renal failure as well. This may be acute or chronic. The symptoms of renal failure are normally not very significant until 75% of the kidney function is destroyed. So now the kidney is only functioning at 25%. So we start to see more symptoms. Now, acute symptoms are going to occur like we see with pain, we see with hematuria, some of those things that we saw with the polycystic disease or even with UTIs. But we see that in the chronic versions, we also can have infertility that takes place, impotence, bone weakness, and even fractures due to the fact that the kidneys are not filtering things out like they should. Waste products start to build up in other organ systems because the blood's not being filtered. Diagnosis is they would do the creatine and blood, uh, they would do blood tests and look at the creatine and the bun. And when we look at this treatment, a lot of times with renal failure is going to include management of the cause of the failure. So again, if they're having the polycystic disease, we want to try to help with that. If they've got some sort of obstruction or blockage, we want to help with that. And so we want to kind of look at the underlining condition that's causing the renal failure. Um, we may want to limit to their sodium and protein intake because again, this could overwork the kidneys because you have retention of fluid. Um, we would want to measure their intake 
intake and their output to make sure that it is similar so that they're not, again, having a lot of edema and swelling that's present. We would have them on anti-hypertensive. So in other words, they would have blood pressure medication to make sure their blood pressure is under control. Diuretics to help remove the excessive fluid and antibiotics because a lot of times they would probably have very frequent UTIs problems there. Long-term treatment is dialysis. And then of course, transplant is the ultimate end goal if renal failure takes place. Now let's talk real quick about the types of dialysis because there are some several, there are several options. Um, the first one is the hemodialysis and this is actually the best type of dialysis. This is where we're going to take the patient's blood. We're gonna do an arterial draw like, so we're gonna go in with a needle on an, art, on an artery and we're gonna pull the blood out. It's gonna run through a machine that's going to filter it like the kidneys would. So it's going to have these membranes that's going to allow stuff to move back and forth where the blood is actually cleaned. The clean blood is then returned into a vein in the patient's body. Now this is the best the best way to have dialysis. However, the problem is, is we have to make sure we have constant access to their blood vessels. This could be a big problem. It can increase our chances of infection. They could have where they run out of areas because those get blown and they have to heal. And so we have to be careful with that one, but it is the best option. There's also what we call the uh, peritoneal dialysis. This is going to be where they add dialysis solution into your peritoneal cavity. So the peritoneal cavity is the cavity of that, that covering we talked about on the digestive system. We have that same thing around the kidneys. The kidneys aren't actually in it, but they are nearby. And so we're using this cavity here for the back and forth. It's going to act as the filter, that membrane, because the kidneys aren't doing that. And so when we look at this, there's a diffusion that happens of the waste products. And then we want to pull the fluid out out by draining the peritoneal cavity. So you place the fluid in there, you um, allow that movement, and then it drains out. They can do this in two ways. We do see there's the continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, where this is going to drain into a bag that the patient wears around their waist. So this is where they have the bag under their clothes, and so they can walk around and go through their normal everyday life. But we also have intermediate peritoneal dialysis. This is going to be served several times a week they have to use this and they are going to go to a medical clinic and use a machine to help with this process. The next we want to look at is adenocarcinoma of the kidney. This is a type of cancer that's found in the kidney and the main risk factor of a patient to develop this is cigarette smoking. Um, frequently it metastasizes, spreads to the liver, brain, and bone before any symptoms actually appear. So this is a problem because anytime we find cancer, if we can find it early before it spreads anywhere else, prognosis is pretty good. We can do treatment. We can help but keep it under control and get rid of it. The problem is, is if it's already metastasized to other areas of the body, especially the brain and the bone, it's a lot harder to treat. Symptoms include painless hematuria, meaning they have blood in their urine, but they're not going to necessarily notice it because it's not painful. They may then start to have flank pain later and fever as the cancer starts to spread. Diagnosis, of course, is going to be where we may use that uh, KUB, where we're going to look at the kidney, ureters, and bladder with the x-ray. We may also use the dye with the IVP, CT scans, and even a biopsy. They may end up doing a nephrectomy where they remove a piece of the kidney, those nephron areas that are the problem. Um, but once it has metastasized, even if we excise and remove pieces, we also will have to have the patient go through chemotherapy and radiation. So you see the treatment here with the adenocarcinoma is the nephrectomy, removing parts of the kidney, chemotherapy, radiation. One of the main things for prevention, it may not be preventable, Okay, because we don't actually know all the causes, but it might be helpful if you do control certain risk factors like not smoking, increasing your intakes of fruits and vegetables. A lot of times that's because they have antioxidants and different things that are helpful um, to your body as a whole. And so it could help potentially delay the formation of cancer. Staying active and maintaining a normal body weight, the healthier you are, the better chance you have of fighting or even not developing the cancer. And then of course, controlling your blood pressure. So these are some things that might be helpful, but because we don't always know the exact cause of what causes the adenocarcinomas of the kidney, we don't really know the, to 
pinpoint exact things to help uh, prevent it. All right, so now let's look at diseases of the bladder. So some things that we can see with the bladder are what we call urinary incontinence. This is the loss of urine flow control. And so we teach kids, so babies are considered incontinent. They just go to the bathroom whenever. That's why when you're changing their diaper, they may even go while you're changing their diaper. As we potty train toddlers, we're trying to teach them on how to control that urination. And so this is going to be where they go into the process of having more control. However, there are times where we start to lose that control. And this is where we look at urinary incontinence, especially in adults. It is more common in females. And the reason being because of pregnancy, in hormone levels, as well as individuals over the age of 65. And this has to do with, with age, the muscles start to get weaker and they get tired and you have a harder time holding it. There are different types of urinary incontinence. There is what we call stress incontinence. And this is when there's stress on the bladder, muscles push down on it and it has a harder time holding it. This is seen when the individual coughs, sneezes, or even laughs, okay? And so when that occurs, they may leak a little bit, they may pee a little bit. And we do see this, like I said, a lot with women, especially if they are pregnant or if they've had multiple pregnancies. There's also an urge incontinence. This is a sudden urge to empty the bladder. So they feel like they have to go right away. Okay. So they can't hold it. Once they get the urge, they have to get to the bathroom. We also have overflow incontinence and overflow incontinence is hard because they don't empty the bladder all the way. So they'll go to the bathroom, but then the bladder is not emptied all the way. And so it causes them to have to constantly go. And so they need to work on emptying the bladder fully. And that's a different set of muscles compared to the ones that hold and make sure that you're not peeing yourself all the time. So again, like I said, there are certain risk factors or higher th things that cause higher risk in females like pregnancy, childbirth, hysterectomies. Also, menopause can affect um, females' incontinence or their continence. And so those are all factors. Obesity is another one that can cause issues um, with this. Now, diagnosis, urine analysis may need to be done as well as a CBC, doing a kind of complete blood count just to look. Um, urodynamic testing, looking at how well you can control and use the muscles as well as post void residual volumes, how much urine is left behind after you go to the bathroom, because this would help you, us determine if you have overflow incontinence. Now, treatment is going to depend on the type of incontinence that's present because they're all a little different. There may be different treatment options. So when we look at these different treatment options, some of them may be behavioral techniques. Behavioral techniques may be like double voiding where you go to the bathroom, you, you go, you go ahead and stop, you go back like right away and try again. Okay. So it's the double voiding, just trying to empty the bladder. Another one is scheduled toileting where you schedule, you're going to go at the same time every hour. Okay. And then you would change it to maybe the same time every two hours, then three hours. And again, it's helping you to train to have better control. Uh, bladder training is part of this as well. Fluid restriction. If you know that you're going to be where you're not going to be able to get to a bathroom, you may want to restrict the amount of fluid you're taking in. And also muscle exercises. These are known as the Kegel exercises um, that you can do to help strengthen those pelvic floor muscles. There's also some medications that could be taken, especially when we talk about women that are gone through menopause. Estrogen levels, estrogen therapy might be helpful with some of that. Um, Therapeutic interventions would be things like collagen injections, Botox, nerve stimulation. Um, we also see that there could be um, some urethral inserts that could be used. These are kind of like a tampon that they put into the urethra to help prevent leaking. Um, we also see that there could be, we also see that we could use a pessary, which is a small stiff ring that's inserted actually into the vagina. And you're thinking, why would we want to insert that there? The tubes are very close together. And what that does is it helps lift to the bladder and prevent leaking as well. Um, there could also be some surgical techniques where they go in and tighten up some of those muscles. They may actually put in some mesh and put the bladder into like a sling to help lift the bladder up. So there are different things that could be done um, for different treatments. 
The next one we want to look at is transitional cell carcinoma of the bladder. This is the most common neoplasm or cancer of the urinary tract, and it arises from the lining of the bladder itself. Um, it is more common in males and those over the age of 60. We do see that the major risk factor is cigarette smoking, but the problem again with this cancer is it is also highly malignant. It does spread very easily. Diagnosis would be done through a cystoscopy and a biopsy to determine the type of cancer. Symptoms only occur at the late stages, and this might be hematuria, dysuria, and nocturia. So blood in the urine, uh, pain or burning when you're with urination, difficulty urinating, as well as needing to go through the night. Treatment is depends on the stage of the tumor. If we can catch it early, the treatment may be just excising it. And they may do, do this through what they call a transurethral resection, where they go in through the urethra, they cut out the tumor and they pull it back through there. There's no actual surgical cuts through your skin. But we may see that there could also be where they do a radical cystectomy, where they remove the bladder altogether. Okay, and so that's a more radical type of surgery and there would have to be some follow-ups with that as well. Another thing that we can see is there are some traumas that can happen to your urinary system. Um, one of the main ones is called a straddle injury. This is going to be a commonly caused injury to the urethra where the urethra gets damaged and hurt. It is more common in males. And again, part of this has to do with the fact that the urethra is a lot larger in males. Like it's a lot, when I say larger, it's a lot longer in males. Accidents include like when you're walking on a fence or a beam and you lose your balance and you straddle. So this is where a lot of times they'll talk about how you rack yourself okay in that sense it could cause issues riding a horse or even a motorcycle could cause this and so it's where it's straddled and there's pressure that goes up into the urethra another type of trauma is called neurogenic bladder this is a dysfunction of the bladder related to actually a nervous system injury this isn't where the bladder's actually been hindered or hurt in the trauma but the nerves that communicate to the bladder have been a lot of times the main type is through a spinal cord injury like a motor vehicle accident could be part of that but if the spinal cord is the main issue anything below the point of injury has problems and this can happen with a spinal cord injury with the bladder being so low. Um, CVAs could also cause this, strokes, tumors, herniated lumbar discs could also cause this, uh, diabetes, dementia, and even Parkinson's disease. When we look at this, symptoms of a neurogenic bladder are going to be things like incontinence, bladder spasms, difficulty, and inability to empty the bladder altogether. Uh, treatment. We want to prevent UTIs from having more issues with a neurogenic bladder and also trying to control the incontinence. And we may do this through catheterization, putting in a catheter to help relieve some. Some rare diseases of the urinary system include good pasture syndrome. This is actually an autoimmune disorder characteristic by glomular nephritis and also pulmonary hemorrhaging. What happens here is that your immune system, again, your immune cells attack things they shouldn't. They attack the actual glomular or nephron area in your kidneys. This causes them to bleed. It causes, start to causing problems with kidneys and also ultimately failure. Um, but it also causes hemorrhaging in the pulmonary regions with the little um, capillaries in there. They'll burst and you'll bleed into their lungs as well. Um, this is actually very fatal due to the renal damage that can occur and also that pulmonary embolisms that could happen due to blood clotting up in the lungs and then clogging the lung or going to the heart. So we do see that this could be an issue, but it's the immune system attacking you and it attacks the kidney and the lungs. We also have another one, which is the interstitial cystitis. This is a non-bacterial cystitis, so it's not due to a urinary tract infection. It's due to the inflammation of the inner lining of your bladder, and again, it is autoimmune. It's your immune system attacking that inner lining, causing inflammation to occur. 
Symptoms with this particular type of cystitis is going to be hematuria, pain, bladder fullness, and urgency. We also see treatment may be an installation where we put in a liquid medication. Um, this liquid medication helps coat the bladder. It helps calm down the immune system. And we do see that this would need to be done for a period of 12 weeks, but there's normally a really good response to this and healing that does take place. All right. Last but not least, let's look at the effects of aging on the urinary system. Well, the main one deals with urinary incontinence. As we get older, we have a harder time holding it like we used to. This is the most common problem. And this is why we have adult diapers and depends because this becomes more of an issue as we age. Another thing that becomes a problem, especially in males, is prostatic hypertrophy. Now, the urethra is going to pass through the prostate and the prostate is like a donut shaped um, gland and the pro and the urethra goes through it. This is fine as long as it stays open. But when we talk about prosthetic hypertrophy, what happens is, is the prostate starts to swell and it kinks up the urethra. Okay. It holds on tight to that urethra. And so it causes there to be either a backflow of urine, urine can't pass through. There's lots of pain with urination. And so we see there may be a dribbling of urine. They may have this idea that they need to go more often with a frequency pain or burn burning and difficulty starting the urine flow. And this does occur as they age, but it's the prostate that's the problem, not really the urinary system. All right, so this finishes up the urinary diseases and disorders. If you have any questions or concerns, please let me know.